I'm sure you've already heard of gravitational waves, because, well, my listeners are the coolest and smartest ever. But did you know about gravity waves? That's right, waves in the sky due to gravity. Sounds awesome, right? Well, I'm pretty sure that Laura Mansfield will confirm your prior. Currently postdoc at Stanford University, Laura studies, guess what, gravity waves and how they are represented in climate models. In particular, she uses Bayesian methods to estimate uncertainty on the gravity wave components of the models. Holding a PhD from the University of Reading in the UK, her background is in atmospheric physics, but she is interested in climate change and environmental issues. So sit back, chill out, and enjoy this physics-packed Ariel episode. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 64, recorded May 19, 2022. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Pandora, like the country. For any info about the podcast, learnbasestats.com is la place to be. Show notes, becoming a corporate sponsor, supporting LBS on Patreon, unlocking Bayesian merch, everything is in there. That's learnbasestats.com. If with all that info, a Bayesian model is still resisting you, or if you find my voice especially smooth and want me to come and teach Bayesian stats in your company, then reach out at alex.endora at pymc-labs.io or book a call with me at learnbasedance.com. Thanks a lot, folks, and best Bayesian wishes to you all. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen. Maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming. How would I know unless I'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like I'm Richard Feynman? Hello, my dear Bayesians. I keep being amazed by your support and generosity, from which I have direct evidence with the growing number of Patreon supporters. This time, I want to personally thank the one and only Scott Anthony Robson, who just joined the full posterior tier. Your support really makes a difference and makes this show possible. Talking about support, companies can also sponsor the show now, and that's what PyMC Labs, the Bayesian consultancy, is proudly doing. Of course, the folks over there know how grateful I am for their support, so feel free to send me an email or book a free call with me if you are curious about our services at PyMC Labs. All the links are in the show notes. And if your company is also interested in sponsoring the show, well, check out the different tiers and rewards at learnbasedstats.com slash support dash v dash show. Now, let's discover why Sky is not even the limit with Laura Mansfield. Laura Mansfield, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Hi, thank you for having me. You bet. Thank you for getting out of bed so early because I'm in Europe and you're in California and I'm torturing you with that recording. Uh, just so listeners know, it is actually 3 a.m. right now for Laura. She just went out of a party from Stanford. So don't worry if nothing makes sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Some parts of that story are not true, by the way, but listeners will have to uncover which part is true, which part is not true. So, uh, Laura, yeah, seriously, thanks for taking the time. I am super excited about that episode because we're going to talk about physics. And I love physics, it turns out. The high schooler I was didn't, but the nerd I am does. So that's awesome. And as usual, let's start with your origin story, because I'm curious about how you came to the stats and physics world, and if it was a serious or more of a straight path. So probably coming into the physics side of things was quite a straight path. I really enjoyed doing physics. That was it, what my degree was in. But while I was studying my undergraduate, I got really interested in environmental issues and climate change. And that's why I went into climate science. The statistics part came a little bit more sinuously. 
So I went to do my PhD program. It was a centre for doctoral training called Mathematics of Planet Earth. And that's where I learned that mathematics is quite different from physics. It's quite a lot more rigorous. So our program covered topics such as dynamical systems, numerics and statistics. And it was where I decided the statistics was the part for me, but definitely more of an applied person. Okay, interesting. So it's like both random and deterministic parts, basically. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, basically, so math and physics and scientific topics interested you since you went out of high school, I guess. Yeah, definitely the physics did. I was really interested in earth systems as well, which is why I think that's how I've ended up in climate science. So I was really interested in geography and volcanoes and rivers and those kind of processes as well. But I think I always knew that physics was my favorite subject. Is there any reason why? Like, do you have physicists in your family? No, I don't know why. Yeah, interesting. And you didn't have like, you didn't have any role model. Was there um, like a, a physicist that you admired and you were like, oh yeah, I'd like to do that kind of work when I'm big? Not particularly. In school, I guess I had quite nice physics teachers. I think I just felt like that was the subject that I was good at and I enjoyed it. I see. Yeah, well, good for you. Physics makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> yeah, they, I completely understand that now. The thing is, I had bad teachers when I was in high school and I was like, I didn't really understand why we were doing that kind of stuff and why it was important, basically. Whereas now I do. <laughs> But anyway, so going back to you, then how would you define the work you're doing nowadays? And also what are the topics that you are particularly interested in? So the area that I'm probably working under is climate or atmospheric dynamics. And by dynamics, we mean processes that govern the weather and the climate. Um, to study those processes, we usually use climate models. So I do a bit of climate modeling, which involves simulating these earth systems, particularly the atmosphere. And we use them to try and understand what's going on in the atmosphere. One of the subjects I'm also quite interested in, and this played part, quite a big role in my PhD, is projecting future climate change. And obviously to be able to do that, we need to understand the systems first. So both of those, understanding the system and projecting future climate change are very linked. And I see Bayesian statistics as a nice tool to help us analyze the output of these climate models and help us understand what's going on. Okay, this is already awesome. So we'll get back to that and what a climate change model means and what you're doing exactly. But from a general point of view, Uh, do you remember how you first got introduced to Bayesian methods, actually? And also, how frequently do you use them today? Yeah, so I think I didn't really get... I'd heard of Bayes' theorem and we'd studied it a little bit during my degree. But it wasn't really till I started my PhD that's when I became more familiar with them. And I definitely found it quite difficult at first. I wasn't too familiar with Bayesian thinking. It took me maybe two years to get used to Bayesian methods. Now I probably use them maybe like 50 to 60% of the time. And the other 40% of the time I'm doing other kind of machine learning methods for climate. I'm curious, what did you find uh, difficult actually when you heard about Bayesian sets? So I think I really struggled with thinking about probabilities and especially the likelihood. I didn't understand what the likelihood was for a long time. And I was also struggling with MCMC methods, particularly. And yeah, trying to code those up myself. I remember struggling with that. I see. Yeah, I can understand that. Are you doing better now? Definitely. <laughs> After a few years, I still did feel like I'm quite new to using Bayesian methods. I'm definitely quite new to the field. I think I've only been using them for five or six years, maybe. I think that's more than me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, I feel like I'm still a newbie. Yeah. I mean, isn't that called scientific thinking? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I understand what you mean. It's like there is always something new to learn. Like, it's not like one day you will wake up and be like, yeah, okay, I'm good now. I don't need to learn anything else. Yeah. Like even Andrew Gelman doesn't think that. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> I definitely feel like I'm very much not an expert. 
I use the methods, but understanding them is a different story. Yeah, well, sometimes from an epistemological perspective, I'm thinking that maybe all the real experts think they are not experts, and the people who think they are experts are actually only not, you know? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Kind of the Dunning-Kruger expert. So it's anti-correlated. Yeah, expert, sorry, effect. <laughs> Dunning-Kruger <laughs> effect. <laughs> yeah, exactly, kind of anti-correlation. I don't know, I'd be curious about that. Okay, and, and actually, you were saying you were cutting up your own MCMC samplers and so on. Do you still do that or do you use open source packages now? I mostly use packages now. I did some MCMC writing them up for myself for kind of making sure I understand them initially. And in my PhD, I did some MCMC methods in R, which I wrote myself. But now I mostly use packages. In which one? So at the moment, I'm using Julia. So I'm using a couple of packages okay. that a group in Caltech developed. So it's like you're using Turing or other things? No, I'm using the package that's quite a small group have developed it. It's called Ensemble Carmen Processes. Oh, okay, cool. So that's in Julia, which is interesting. I'm learning a new language. Yeah. Do you have the name of the package? We should put that in the show notes. Yeah, I can do. That's it. It's called Ensemble Carmen Processes. Okay, cool. So for listeners, we'll end that in the show notes because I know there is a big Bayesian Julia community and it's been a while since I talked about Julia on the, on the show. So I know those listeners want more episodes about that. And yeah, I promise you there will be more. Uh, just send me some names of interesting people in the Julia community, introduce me to them and I will make episodes. Yeah, okay, I can do that. Oh, yeah. So I was talking to you, Laura, but mainly I was also talking to the listeners. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give you orders like that, but yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. There is a new email address now, learnbasedats at gmail.com, so you can reach me there. Of course, if you're a patron of the show, you have me on the Slack channel, so you can uh, reach me that way. Or, of course, Twitter is always available, and there is now a Twitter account for the, for the podcast, which I... Yeah, that's at Learn Based Stats. So you folks know how to reach me. Awesome. So perfect. Yeah, we'll add that to the show. That's super cool. So right now, yeah, you're mainly using Julia and those packages to work on your Bayesian models, basically. Yes. Cool. When did you pick up Julia, actually? So I've only started using Julia in the, probably just at the beginning of this year. And that's just because it's what the uh, Caltech group have written this code in it's because the code exists and I've seen other people apply the same methods that I'm applying to a different type of component of climate modeling so I'm carrying out the same analysis as them that's the main reason but Julia feels nice it makes nice plots yeah it seems very similar to Python so easy to read and easy to pick up cool that's good to know yeah so if people are curious about it apparently it's a good experience for now. And so actually, how frequently are Bayesian stats used in your field? Because you said you're using them quite frequently, but what about your field in general? They're probably not used too much in my field. It's definitely growing. There's two main areas that do use Bayesian stats that I'm aware of, and that would be data assimilation, which is when we try to combine data from satellites and ground-based observations. We want to combine them with the output of numerical climate models or weather models. And that's when Bayesian stats can be quite useful for integrating those two. The other area is the area that I'm in, which is uncertainty quantification and checking the components of climate models, how much uncertainty are they producing in the output of the climate model. And we also use them for calibration of these components. Nice. Okay. Is there an upward trend on the use of those methods or is like still like kind of the same? Yeah, there's definitely an upward trend. It's definitely growing quite a lot. I've seen a lot more people mention Bayesian statistics now, as well as machine learning is really growing in our field. So also emulating components of climate modeling and Bayesian statistics is used even in that emulation side of things as well. Okay. Do you have any idea why? Easy access to personal computing now? or I think, yeah, firstly, access to computing. Secondly, probably 
funding. If you say that you're doing machine learning and say that you're doing new novel methods, that definitely helps with funding. And I think people are just becoming much more interested in using these approaches. And machine learning and Bayesian statistics are really useful tools for helping us to analyze the output of these climate models. I see. Well, that's cool. Actually, let's talk about what you're doing now, because your PhD focused on learning relationships between climate change patterns and anthropogenic forcings. So first, what does that mean to a human? <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. absolutely don't know what that means. A few long words in there. I saw that on your website. I was like, hmm. That sounds interesting, but what is that? <laughs> okay, so I'll start with like the overall summary is that I was basically looking at how this will climate change in the future, depending on the amount and the types of emissions that we as humans add to our atmosphere. So that word forcing, that basically just means something that we change an external force on the climate system. So just like when you push a car or something, you're adding some kind of force to that to make it move in a certain direction or change direction. And the forcing is the exact same thing in climate. We add something such as carbon dioxide to the atmosphere that starts us moving towards a warmer climate. So that's what forcing means. And we have two types of forcings. You can get natural ones that occur naturally. So an example of that might be natural changes in the solar cycle that can cause a change in a warming up of the climate or a cooling down. And the other one is this anthropogenic term. So that just means human induced. It means something that we're doing. So an anthropogenic forcing would be adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere or adding methane to the atmosphere. And the what I was doing in my PhD was looking at how climate will change due to a range of different scenarios that we might be under in the future based on what humans might do. And that's why we looked at patterns of climate change in particular. So climate change is probably not going to happen the same amount everywhere over the globe. Some areas might warm faster than others. So that's what we mean by looking at climate change patterns. Okay, I see. Did that make sense? Yeah, 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 totally. Okay, yeah, thanks for the clarification. So that I'm curious, how did you do that? Like, how did you tackle that question? So like, tell us about the model or the method and also what were your conclusions, if any, but it seems that you had some conclusions. Yeah. So firstly, we'll start with what the usual method to try and answer these questions yeah. is, and that would be using global climate models. So these models are quite complex. We use a computer to simulate the entire Earth system. And that can include a lot of different components. So the atmosphere, which is what I specialize in. The oceans would also be included in those. And so would other components like the land, vegetation, and even ice. So these climate models include the interactions between all these different components. And we try and predict what will happen if we give it a certain scenario. So to try and answer what's going to happen to the climate, If I say, let's increase carbon dioxide emissions, but let's decrease methane emissions and let's increase some other emissions of aerosols or sulfate aerosol, which is another important climate forcing. So if we, we can put these scenarios together and run that in our climate model, and we would then look at what the output looks like. So we would look at things like the temperature, precipitation and pressure levels and so on. So that's the traditional approach. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So these models are really expensive. As I mentioned, they contain lots of different components. And we want to track all of the properties of the climate at the same time. So they end up being really expensive to run. And because we're running them for long time scales, we need to run them out for, say, centuries to be able to get a solid answer. Oh, yeah. well, okay, that's a long time. It is, yeah, because climate change can take time. And so they're, because they're really expensive, one of the things I was interested in doing was looking at building an emulator of those climate models. So I worked on making a Gaussian process emulator to try and be able to answer some of these questions more rapidly. 
And then we can also assess sensitivity of the climate to these different emissions and so on. Why would Gaussian processes be more efficient here? Because Gaussian processes are usually hard to compute. They're, they're hard to train, I guess, the building of the Gaussian process, yeah. But once you've got that all done, you can run it really quickly and get almost instantaneous predictions. So for that, I would say, for the Gaussian process, I would put in the emissions that I'm changing in my climate model and then just get an estimate of how much will the surface temperature change if I change these emissions. And the Gaussian process would be on what dimension? The time or the geographical location or both? Geographical location was what I focused on. You could do it with time as well. And I also focused on different types of emissions as well. So there's other emissions other than greenhouse gases that might be of interest to study in the climate. So it was like, so the goal of the model was basically to understand the geographical patterns, the covariance between geographical regions, basically, of like if one region gets affected highly by climate change, how does that region re next to it react? Yes. Yeah. Was there some time negative correlations? Time negative. What did you mean by time negative? No, no, some negative correlation. Oh, some negative. There, I'm sure there would be. Okay. I'd be interested in the process. Why? Because like in my mind, it would be like, yeah, one region gets hotter because of climate change or something, or, or maybe colder. And then why would a region next to it be the opposite? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, that does happen in climate models. I can't say this will definitely happen in the real world, but there's certain areas that appear to look like they're cooling or warming less than other areas. And there's lots of different reasons for why that might happen physically. Yeah, okay. Some examples might be mountains, for example, and things that get in the way of the climate. They might warm or cool more. So mountains would probably warm more than other areas surrounding it because they have snow ice melt, for example. Oh yeah, but here it's still a positive correlation, right? Geographically. Because everything is getting warmer. It's not like the mountain is getting colder, whereas the surroundings are getting warmer. I see what you mean. They would still be getting warmer, but they would be getting, one would be warming faster than the other. Yeah, exactly. But you could also have counteracting emissions. So there are pollutants that we put into the atmosphere that cause a cooling effect. The example that I'm most familiar with is the sulfate aerosol. So that's usually emitted along with when we burn fossil fuels and coal in particular. And that causes cooling that can cover up some of our warming caused by carbon dioxide. So then you can get this some areas cooling, some areas warming effect. That is cool. Well, that is interesting. I don't know if that's cool, but okay. Could that be used to counteract some of the effects of the uh, climate change or not? So that is a very controversial topic, actually. Yeah. It's the topic of geoengineering, yeah. where we add extra sulfate aerosol to the sky. Um, and because that sulfate aerosol reflects light, that's how it ends up cooling the surface below it. But I personally don't believe that's a, the best option. We'd effectively be trying to cover up yeah. the warming, but we'd still be adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So we'd still have problems with oxide acidification, for example, and the other effects of carbon dioxide. And also sulfate aerosol doesn't last in the atmosphere for that long. So oh, yeah. once it falls out of the atmosphere, we'd have to keep doing it. Yeah, otherwise you warm everything even more because you've got even more carbon dioxide. Yeah, exactly. Because you put it there. Interesting. And so that was the methods that you used. And I guess so using a Gaussian process to relate the Covari geographical covariance was the main, uh, the main new contribution that you brought. And what could you conclude based on that analysis? So some of my conclusions were looking at how the different pollutants affect different regions as well. So if we emitted sulfate aerosol from a certain region, say like North America, how would that affect the temperature slightly further afield? in North America and Europe. And we found different sensitivities to these pollutants in different regions. That was one of the interesting findings. Okay. And so based on that, theoretically, you could have an action of 
on the pollutants that are released in those regions to make climate change slower or not? So I would say we would know what areas we need to really focus reducing our emissions quicker from that. I don't think we should add any more sulfate to the air. Yeah, it's also not good for our lungs, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And so what, what were those regions you said? So generally, this is, we have seen this in previous studies as well. Northern hemisphere, changing the emissions in the northern hemisphere affect other neighboring northern hemispheric regions. And so they kind of go along with latitude and then tropical perturbations to emissions affect other tropical areas, even if they're further afield. That would be the long story short. Oh, so you mean like, so tropical areas all over the world would be affected if one of the tropical areas gets warmer? Or have I understood badly? First, I want to add a caveat that it's using climate modeling. So we're not sure if it's, I can't guarantee this is going to happen. Obviously, it's only with climate models I've been working with. So whether or not this will apply to the real life, we can't say. But yes, it was. So if you perturbed emissions in one tropical area, say like around South America, that had a fairly, that mo the biggest impact there would be in South America, the localized effect, but also further afield, it would be other tropical areas around a similar latitude. And the same for if you perturbed emissions in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. Okay. That all makes sense. Yeah. Latitudes are more important than longitude, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And do we understand why? Or it's like the direction of winds or stuff like that? Yeah, I would say that's probably the main reason. So winds tend to flow around the earth along latitude lines. Okay. Well, then my question would be, why do they do that? Why? That's a, a proper uh, physics, simple answer. The earth is spinning. So winds like to go around the way that the earth's spinning. We've got momentum going around. I see. Yeah around the axes of the Earth. Okay, pretty simple answer in the end. I'm surprised. Okay, super cool. What was the, um, the main difficulty you encountered with this project? So I'd say with, as a general difficulty throughout the whole of my PhD was being in between two subjects. So I was working with climate modeling and working with climate scientists. But at the same time, I was working on Bayesian statistics and working using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. I think it was joining those two up. They probably felt like I was doing two different things at the same time. And being between those was difficult. I feel like I'm getting, I was getting identity crisis from this. Am I a climate scientist? Am I a Bayesian statistician? So being in between those, and it meant that then I had to communicate to both sides. So I had to communicate the Bayesian statistics to the climate scientists and vice versa. Yeah. What was the hardest? Out of the two, Bayesian statistics, definitely. Maybe because it's not my field and it was new to me. And so one of the things I was doing there was working with high dimensional data and using Bayesian statistics on high dimensional data was also difficult. Yeah, for sure. So what did you use there? Like, were you already using Julia or were you using Stan or PyMC? So for the Bayesian statistics, side of things. I used R, but I did also use Python for quite a lot. I, probably two thirds of my PhD was Python and one third R. Okay. My question would be, what did you not learn during your PhD? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a... R, Python, <laughs> Julia. Well, yeah, I didn't know Julia. Bayesian stats, climate models. That's good. I also did some theater. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I can see how it can feel overwhelming at times. So, well, that's super cool. So, and in the end, like, is there a big thing that you think you've learned from all these PhD experience? Doesn't have to be something technical, but like, when you think back to your PhD experience, is there like a big learning that you can draw from it? I think probably being able to communicate the Bayesian statistics to people that don't use it and climate science to people that aren't familiar with it. I hope, I hope that I can do that now <laughs> since I've been doing it for so long. Yeah, I understand. Cool. And we probably have some things to teach me then. You can test me on this. If you don't understand a word of what I've said about climate science, then <laughs> we'll know. Oh, I can. Okay, so let's start again. 
the podcast. <laughs> Nora Mansfield, welcome <laughs> to Learning Bayesian Statistics. <laughs> I didn't know I could ask you again. <laughs> no, of course, I'm kidding. Okay, but you probably have some things to teach me because that's what I'm trying to do with this podcast. So you'll give me your secrets off the record. <laughs> Okay, now let's talk about your latest work because it sounds really, really cool. You're working on gravity waves parameterizations in atmospheric models. So first, what are gravity waves? Because that sounds awesome. Yeah, so I'm sorry to disappoint you. They are not gravitational waves, which are those very cool waves of ripple through space and time. Unfortunately, gravity waves maybe aren't so interesting. I find them interesting still. They're still waves, but it's not gravitational waves. So gravity waves, maybe a better term would be buoyancy waves, or sometimes they're called, we also have inertia gravity waves. So these are waves in air, ripples through the air caused by a restoring force of buoyancy or gravity. So these usually form due to a disturbance in the flow, which could be a mountain or a storm or a front. And this would cause a disturbance in the flow that creates a wave pattern. So you can think of it like... In the flow of air. In the flow of air, yeah. I was going to give an example with a river because maybe that's easier to imagine. If you have a river flowing and it is flowing quite parallel to the surface, so lines of constant flow are parallel to the surface, But if we have a rock in the way, the water would be forced to go above the rock. And that causes a disturbance that propagates up and downstream of the flow. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I guess that the more massive the object, the bigger the disturbance. Yes, exactly. And there's, we can apply that to the atmosphere where instead it's air flowing and we have a mountain in the way. But one of the important differences there is the density of air decreases as you go upwards in the atmosphere. So when you have a mountain, you're displacing dense air near the surface up to an area where the air is less dense. So you get this kind of ripples of low density and high density air that propagates upwards. Does that make sense? It propagates mostly upwards, but also downwind as well. Yeah, that's super cool. And I guess that's called gravity waves because like those massive objects have more gravity, basically. Yeah, it's all to do with the density of the air. So if the air is more dense, I guess that's why it's it's being pulled back down due to gravity. I guess that's why they're called gravity waves. But I think I've also heard them called buoyancy waves, but buoyancy is kind of the opposite of gravity. <laughs> Less dense, it's all to do with density. Yeah, I agree that gravity waves is confusing with gravitational waves. But as a non-English speaker, buoyancy waves, I would not understand that. Like, I have to look at it, actually. I think it's a weird autograph, right? It's like B-U-Y-O, something like that. Yeah, that's how that's spelled. B-U-Y, how do you spell? B-U-O-Y. Oh, B-U-O-Y. A-N-T-Y. Oh, yeah, buoyancy, my God. And it's good that you pronounce that name, because for a French guy, so if you want me to pronounce that with a French accent, I guess that most French people would say buoyancy, (laughs) which is actually a singer. Who is actually a singer? Yeah, you just put a ring on it. Buoyancy, okay. Wow, what is it in French? You might be pronouncing it right and all English speakers are pronouncing it completely wrong. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, not sure about that. Oh, flotability. Okay, yeah, indeed. That is exactly the opposite of gravity. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, so like, have you heard of those things in the ocean called a buoy, but they're spelt with this? Yeah. It's, that's... Buoyancy. Yeah. And actually in French, that's called a bouée. So here. Ah, oh, so you probably are pronouncing it right and I'm pronouncing it completely wrong. Bouée, bouée. That's really close. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. That's super interesting. And so what do those waves mean, basically? So you take the, like, around a massive mountain, like Everest, for instance, or Mont Blanc, or don't remember the name of the huge mountain in the South America, in South America, but... The gravity of those objects is like super huge, right? So that means that it's a huge obstacle to air flows. And so basically the air, which is very dense at the bottom of the mountains, is going up to, well, upper in the atmosphere where the air is less dense. Yeah. 
Okay. Exactly. So what? Well, who cares? Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, so I hate those questions, right? But like here, basically, yeah, okay. So that happens. Why is that interesting and what are the effects? Yeah, so we care about that because these waves propagate upwards in the atmosphere and eventually they break. And that would just be like waves breaking on a shore. And when they do that, they deposit some of their energy into the atmosphere. They give it to the winds, for example. So that changes the wind flow. And a lot of the time it can even change the direction of the wind flow, which completely changes the circulation in the atmosphere. And it can cause effects down back. Up. So this happens high up in the atmosphere, but that still has effects for us down at the surface because it can change the weather. So if the direction of wind is changed, that can completely affect our weather. Yeah, it changes the weather. Okay. And what would those waves break? Well, like, do they encounter obstacles in the air, in the atmosphere or do they just pan, fan out, you know, like because a wave, if it doesn't have any obstacle, the wave just loses in intensity, right? Like gravitational waves, they don't really have obstacle, they just ripple, but the intensity is smaller and smaller with time. Here, it seems like it's not like that with gravity waves. No, I would say it's actually kind of the opposite. So the important thing to remember is that the air is less dense as you go higher up. So that actually means that the waves increase in amplitude. Oh, because there's less obstacle. Yeah, as they travel upwards. So eventually they just get too big and that's why they break. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. We say that they break at a critical level where they've reached high enough in the atmosphere that they're too big and they break. Oh, okay. So like... Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> imploding, cool. under their own, imploding under their own weight. <laughs> yeah. Do they make sound though? Like, because theoretically you could hear them or not. Oh, I don't know. I've never thought about that. I would guess they... Because there is air, right? It's not space. So, I mean, does a tree make a sound in a forest where there's no one there to hear it if it falls down? I think probably they don't make sound, but no one's there to hear. No one's up in the atmosphere listening for these gravity waves breaking. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> Although that would be a cool job. What's your job? Oh, I'm working up in the atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. I'm listening for gravity waves. Yeah, interesting. I need to ask one of my colleagues if they know the answer to that, because I'm not sure. Yeah, like, I mean, theoretically... Could we listen to a gravity wave? That would be cool. I think they probably don't make sounds, unfortunately. But yeah, I'll find out. I don't know. Maybe you should, yeah, because maybe the the answer is is there. Maybe they talk to us. <laughs> they tell us what they are doing. That'd be cool. Okay, so then they break, and that can change the weather. Okay, so then could we use that to change the effect of climate change? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Like with big fans, you know, you can imagine people with big fans at the bottom of Mount Everest and like just doing a lot of wind. <laughs> Interesting. I've never, I've never heard anyone suggest that. <laughs> maybe I should start a career of physicists, maybe. Yeah, it would be quite a lot of work, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's not a topic like maybe using gravitational, no, gravity waves to change the weather. It's not something. No, and mostly when we talk about the changes they make to the weather, it's associated with the circulation of the winds. I don't know if that would count. They would be super useful for counteracting a warming world due to greenhouse gases. But yeah, they change the circulation, which is still obviously changes localized weather. Yeah, seems like there is a PhD topic here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, and actually then, what's the end game for you of that project? What are you trying to achieve with this project? And maybe another way of asking that is, what does parameterizing gravity waves in atmospheric model means concretely? Yeah. So in the project that I'm in, we've got lots of people working on different aspects of gravity waves. So there's people who work on trying to understand how much they change the atmosphere in terms of momentum and energy, and they would use observations. I personally am working more on putting these gravity waves into climate models. So I mentioned that climate models are these really complex simulations of the Earth system. And to do that in practice, we have to split the Earth up into domain with a grid or a mesh. So if you can think, for example, it would be longitude, latitude and a height direction. So we've got a 3D grid. So this can be quite expensive if these grids are really small. So usually 
one grid cell might be from 100 kilometers to 300 kilometers in size. And a lot of processes that happen in the atmosphere are smaller than that grid cell size. And gravity waves is one of those. They can have really small length scales of tens of kilometers. So these don't get resolved in the climate model. They're too small, smaller than the grid. And instead, we have to put them into what we call a parameterization. It's just a component of climate modeling. And usually it refers to something that's smaller than the grid cell. So there's other examples. Clouds, for example, are smaller than a single grid cell in a climate model. So to be able to model them, we can't resolve them. We have to make assumptions and put in a kind of... We make assumptions about them and put them in to this... In, yeah, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. I just got an email. <laughs> and it went off in my ear. So for a parameterization, we put it into the climate model to estimate the effects that these smaller scale processes have on the climate model. So we are estimating the effect that it has within a single grid cell on that grid cell. And that would then in turn affect the rest of the global domain. So the example for gravity waves of this assumption that we have to make is that we assume it only travels in one direction upwards, when in reality, it probably gravity waves can travel horizontally as well. Yeah, to the side. Yeah. I see. And so I didn't understand, like, why can't you model them in the climate model? What is the relationship with the grid cell again? So within climate models, we have a grid, a three-dimensional grid of longitude, latitude, and height. And what happens on those grid cells is we have important variables that can move about between the grid cells. So those would be wind, temperature, pressure, humidity, and so on. And anything that's smaller than that grid cell, you can't actually resolve it in terms of numerically. If there's a wavelength smaller than the width of the grid cell, for example, you can't capture that. I understand. So instead, that's why we build parameterizations, which... So you need a model of the smaller things inside the grid cell. Yeah, exactly. And instead, we try and estimate the large scale effects of these small things. Okay, yeah. So it's a bit similar to what happens when you work with a Gaussian process, for instance, and you're trying to infer the length scale, but the length scale is actually smaller than the resolution of your data. Yeah. So, for instance, if you have a GP whose length scale on time is, I don't know, 10 seconds, but your data points are only every 30 seconds, you cannot resolve, you cannot solve, you cannot identify that length scale because you can never, well, see it. Exactly. It's exactly the same. You don't know what's happening in between, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you need a model on top of that. Yeah. And this is quite a big problem in climate modeling. So clouds are another example that they're smaller than a grid and turbulence as well, these small scale turbulent processes. Oh, are those the same turbulences that we get in the plane? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. So these are all processes that we have to build a parameterization to try and estimate the effects of them. And so what are those actually? They are just like some flow of air? Yeah, turbulence I don't know much about, but it would be kind of swirls and vortices in the air. Okay, some loops. And so, well, concretely, what are you using to model that? What kind of model? Like, what's the generative process, basically, of your model? Super current. So this is a, not my favorite programming language, but all, pro, all, not all, but most climate models are written in Fortran. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I wouldn't say I'm that familiar with Fortran. I can read parts of it if I absolutely have to. But yeah, so we put within our climate model, we'll have lots of chunks of code. So there'll be the general physical equations that we know about. So conservation of mass and, and conservation of momentum. And that would be for the entire domain, where for the large scale processes as well. And then we have to add terms to that to say, oh, wait, we've got this extra term, this component, this gravity wave component. And then we add some other terms. Oh, wait, we've also got this turbulence component. We've also got these clouds. These all get added to the equations that we try and solve for climate modeling. Does that make sense? That's how a parameterization is included. So it's all based on math. Yeah, yeah. Like you have the equations 
Oh yeah, that's quite a luxury in physics. Like you have equations for everything basically and your goal is to translate those equations in the, in the program. Yeah, and that's why it's slightly more difficult with these small processes because they're really hard to measure. We don't have solid concrete ways or even methods for putting them in this kind of parameterization. It's not so physics-based. It's still physics-based, but it's not a solid equation that we can include. I see. Is that why Bayesian stats are useful here? Because you can use priors and you can estimate uncertainty? So I use them for estimating the uncertainty associated with the gravity wave parameterization, but we don't use them within the parameterization. So instead, I would say in this parameterization, we have gravity wave parameters that are, they have to be assumed. We're not completely sure what they should be. So for example, what should the speed of these gravity waves be? If we're not too sure of that, then it can affect the output. And that's where we say, if I were this uncertain about what the speed of these gravity waves should be, how uncertain is our model output, which would be say, the speed of the winds in a certain area or temperature or any climate property. Okay, I see. And that's where I use the Bayesian statistics for. Okay, and that's because you get the uncertainty estimation. Yeah. And are you able to have some informed priors on those parameters? Yes, we do have some priors based on expert knowledge of, say, the speed of the gravity waves should be between probably more than 10 meters per second, probably less than 100. So we have quite a big... Oh, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here, definitely. And that does help. I guess that does help the estimation, right? Because you already don't have a lot of data and a lot of uncertainties. So if you have good priors, that does help a lot, right? So yeah, the experts can give us information on what they should be. And then we can use calibration methods to try and update those and get better estimates to get like the posterior distribution on these parameters, such as the speed. Yeah, I see. And then I'm also curious, can you test your model? Like, can you make predictions? And like about, I don't know, like in those conditions, we should observe gravity waves with that, with those properties. And then you can, I don't know, watch Mount Everest for a lot of time. And when those conditions arrive, you can measure the gravity waves and see whether those observations match the theory. And that way you can confirm your theory and your model. Or is that something that's completely impossible? Yes, that is what we do. Okay. We do so getting measurements of gravity waves is quite difficult. And we're getting more and more measurements now since we've got a lot more um, satellite data. We've got more plane data from planes and from balloons that with we get balloons sent up into the atmosphere to run a campaign to like understand these gravity waves a bit better. So these take lots of measurements for us. So we've got new data on what the gravity waves do and the amount of energy or momentum that they give to the atmosphere. So that's one way that we try and understand if our models are correct. Okay, that's good. Because <laughs> otherwise you're like, yeah, I don't know how to test that. It's complicated. Yeah, exactly. No, we have to have some way to, yeah. to constrain the... How do you measure concretely a, a gravity wave actually? So what we would do is quite difficult and I don't know too much about the how we get the data, but I believe that we take measurements high up in the in the stratosphere, which is really high up in the atmosphere, above this like dense air. So it's where the air is it's not so dense. And we it's kind of the height that a plane would fly at. So around that height in the atmosphere. And we would measure the wind speed, the, the pressure, the temperature, and we can calculate properties of gravity waves from some of these properties that we measure. So sometimes we just, we would have a balloon, like a hot air balloon, imagine, and this would be sent up into this high level in the atmosphere, the stratosphere, we call it. And these would then just travel about however they want to. They don't get controlled. They can just go wherever they want. And then we can use GPS data to see where that's gone. And then within that data, we can analyze these gravity waves. That's nice. Yeah, those experiments always in physics are super interesting. Like, how do you measure this stuff? And it's like, 
extremely complicated. It is. Like measuring gravitational waves, for instance, is yeah. insanely complicated and have to be. And similar to gravitational waves, where you have a lot of noise in the system that can make it difficult to actually detect anything. We do have similar problems with in climate science in general, where the variability in the climate kind of is an extra difficult component. We've got loads of noise and we need to find out where's the signal. Like getting that signal from the noise is another difficulty. And I'm sure that's true everywhere in physics, actually. Yeah, I mean, the instruments must have a precision that's just huge. Yeah, so one instrument that one of my colleagues was using had an uncertainty in temperature of five Kelvin or five degrees C, which I thought, that, that's a massive, that can't be that useful. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of, a lot of uh, data is much better than that. That was one exception where the data wasn't designed for atmospheric scientists. <laughs> Usually it's much better than that. Five degrees, I think you can't do much with. Yeah, no, it's definitely something like, at least has known a, a lot of progress in, in the recent years, like how yeah. like the precision of measures, of measures is like way, way more precise now and so you can imagine maybe in 30 years we'll have much more precise instruments that will help us discover even more impressive things in the world of physics. Yeah, that would be great. It's really good to see the results of satellite data as well because that's been growing so much in the last 30 years that we've got loads more data to work with. Yeah, for sure. And I'm wondering what's your main obstacle right now in the in this project? So at the moment there's probably one of the main obstacles, and this is something that has is a problem in general, but these complex climate models are so expensive, it takes so long to run. And that means we don't have so much high resolution climate model data, especially when you want to get data where you've got a small grid cell. If you go to a smaller grid cell, you can get a more accurate climate prediction. That obviously takes much longer to run. So that would be a one obstacle, I guess, getting this data from these expensive climate models. And because of that, we may not have tons of data to work with in order to look at machine learning methods that might help. So if we're trying to emulate a climate model, for example, something that I mentioned I have done in my PhD, we don't always have enough to build to be able to build neural networks, for example. We don't have thousands of data points. But we can't, even though we have a few data points, these can be huge individual data points with lots and lots of properties of the climate, lots of time steps, a large spatial grid. So working out what methods are best to use for your data, I think is probably one of the main obstacles for me, thinking about the possible different routes that you could take and what's the best approach for your specific data set and for what your goals are. I see. I do hope that you'll get there. Actually, a bit more generally, but I'm curious because you said that you're always learning based on stats, basically. And so from your point of view and mainly for your work, what do you think are the biggest hurdles in the Bayesian workflow? I think for me personally, it was the getting started and understanding what Bayesian means, getting started with this Bayesian thinking and thinking in terms of probabilities instead of point estimates. I think that may also be a bit of a hurdle for other people in the climate science community as well. So it's difficult to get into these methods and it can take a long time to start to understand them. So why bother? Let's just use what we've always used. I think that could be a, a big hurdle. So it's more theoretical understanding that something that you cannot do with the Bayesian package that you are using right now, and that's a bit frustrating. Yeah, I don't have a specific problem with the Bayesian package. Uh, I would say it's more starting off on the Bayesian thinking and using probabilities, but it's definitely a growing field for us in climate science. We're seeing much more Bayesian analysis of climate model data and observations and so on. Yeah, it's also something that we noticed like in the labs team and also again with uh, Ravin Kumar and Thomas Vicky, two partners in crime in the PNC team. We are launching very, very soon a, an online course of it, exactly that, like people who want to start with Bayesian stats, but have just started hearing about it, but don't really know where to start. 
Yeah, that would be great. I wish I had something like Bayesian statistics for scientists or for physicists. That's what I would have loved to have some kind of resource like that when I was getting started. Yeah, for sure. Well, here it's not for scientists, it's for beginners. Yeah, even that. For sure. And basically we're trying to get the basics done as intuitively as possible, which means like as little math as possible, like more code than math so that you can see and experiment and try more than write. Yeah, that's definitely the best way to learn, I think. Yeah, personally, personally, that, that will help me when I started, that's for sure. Yeah, putting things into practice in a workshop kind of tutorials and so on, they definitely are the best way for that I found learning. Yeah. Okay, time is flying by, Laura, and maybe I have one last question before the, the last two ones. Do you have any other particular project that you are excited to work on for the month to come? So I would say the Gravity Wave project that I'm on, where we've got a bunch of people from different universities and modeling centers trying to get better estimates of these gravity waves. But also there's a lot of other people working in a similar field, but not just for gravity waves. So for example, clouds and ocean processes where we still want to parameterize these processes and they're smaller than the grid scale and have it and seeing what they do as well. We can work together and see if we can do similar things for gravity waves. So those would be the areas that I'm most excited that are coming up, especially using machine learning and Bayesian methods to try and help us with these parameterizations. Nice. Oh, actually, no, I also wanted to ask you um, if you have any, like, any big modern mistakes that you made one day and how, how you realized it and then you solved it. Yeah, so I have a big one from my PhD where I was trying to get this data. I was running these climate models to get this data to build my Gaussian process emulator. And running climate models is, I mentioned they're really complex. They're also really complex to use. So it involves going into the code and changing certain values within a really complicated kind of file. And I did, I tried to automate this process of building my Gaussian process emulator saying like, uh, let's sample this parameter space and then change this parameter A, parameter B, parameter C, but I mixed them up. So I ended up changing them to really strange values because I tried to automate it without properly checking. And I ended up having to run that climate model a lot more than needed. I had to repeat the entire process and do it again when I noticed. Because I got some results where it was, the way I noticed was, yeah, I thought I had changed some emissions in North America. And I was looking at the results thinking, what? These look like they're really affecting Asia, surface temperature in Asia, which doesn't seem right. And that was how I noticed. I was like, oh, wait a minute. I've changed the wrong area. And I had to repeat the entire thing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I guess we've all been there. So, yeah, if you take anything away from this, it's that climate models are complicated. Yeah, to run. So, like, how long usually does it take to run run them? So that mistake took, like, maybe a couple of months. Oh, wow. To redo. They take, take, yeah, it depends on who has access to the computer. So people working on, at, like, say, the Met Office or... The French Met Office and all of those, they would have more access to the data, the high performance computing systems. But generally, I think it would take from anywhere from weeks to months to run a long climate model simulation. Damn. So if like if you did a typo. Exactly. <laughs> that's a costly typo. Oh my God. Each time you run the model, you must be freaking out. Yeah, I know. Please, please. And what's actually quite worrying is that I'm worried that I'm wasting energy as well. So I wasted a lot of electricity and energy running those simulations that ended up being garbage. So I think it's important to be really careful. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, damn. Oh, yeah. I don't know what I would do for that because I do run a lot of models. (laughs) I love iterating on my models. If I could not do that, I would be sad. And... I mean, definitely this. But the good thing, though, is that in between two iterations of the model, you can take weeks or months of holidays <laughs> because you don't have to do. True. Yeah. You don't have to do anything. But well, what, what are you doing? Waiting for my model to run. Yeah, exactly. Nice time off. Yeah, perfect. Every nine months, 
nine months of holidays. That's cool. <laughs> That's cool. Well done. That's a good career path. <laughs> okay, awesome, Laura. Well, let's call it to show. Of course, I'm going to ask you the last two questions that I ask every guest at the end of the show. So first one, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? So I think you probably know what I'm going to say for that one. Yeah. How to run climate models faster. <laughs> yeah, although... I would say something to do with climate change, but then having unlimited resources is exactly what got us into this, this problem with climate change. We don't have unlimited resources, so I don't want that to be <laughs> the goal, really. But I would say something to do with reducing climate change, whether we could come up with some amazing new sustainable energy or say maybe we could get fusion work in, that would be nice, nuclear fusion something that's more sustainable than our current greenhouse gas emission producing fossil fuels. So that would be, of course, the problem I would like to solve. How confident are you about, about this? Like, what do you think our, bed, our best bet is? Is it to find a way to colonize other planets or is it to find ways of consuming resources in a more sustainable and efficient way? I think... I don't want to start colonizing other planets. I don't feel like that's a... No, that's like, so it's a provocative question to like understand your level of basically optimism. Yeah, I was thinking, oh, I don't want to leave everyone on a really negative note. So I think... It, well, you can. No, I think... There is another question after that. True. Well, I think if we all... I don't think it should be all down to the individual either, but I think we can reduce our consumption of things a little bit everywhere. And I think we can come up with ways to get more renewable and sustainable energies so that we don't have this problem. Yeah. Another thing I would be a bit optimistic about in the future, I think we will be able to get some kind of carbon capture and storage working as well. If that starts working and becomes feasible, large scale, that would also be great. I want to be optimistic about that. For sure. Yeah. Now, one of the things that make me optimistic are, like, if you look at, means of transportation is like things like cars or trains. Like trains were catastrophic at the very beginning. Like when, one century ago, trains were catastrophic from a climate change standpoint. Now we've managed to find a way to run high speed trains, which are the most sustainable and efficient ways of transportation for now. Like, well, except for biking and walking, but. Yeah, exactly. Maybe in one century, it will be the same for planes. That would be great. And I'm starting to see that for cars because I live in Silicon Valley. So everyone has a Tesla here. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, that's always also something I, I try to be careful of is that people making predictions about like the, the evolution of climate change are also forgetting the evolution of technology in those predictions. And, and the evolution of technology is super hard to take into account. Right? Because I'm, I'm pretty sure if you ask someone a century ago whether they thought that trains would be the most, the cleanest way of transportation later, they would have answered no. So it's something like it's those sort of known unknowns that are, that can really mess up your predictions. And like also we have a bias of like making predictions with the current, you know, context of technology and knowledge. Yeah, I think. I agree with that. So one of the main uncertainties in climate modeling is the uncertainty of what we're going to do to the atmosphere. We really, it's such a wide range. Yeah. And it's like, are we going to continue as now? Is it going to get better? And it's really hard to predict that. So it's really hard to predict the future climate. Yeah, I understand. Well, then second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, fictional, who would it be? So I think I would pick Emmy Noether, who is a German mathematician from the late 19th century, early 20th century. Have you heard of her? No, it's definitely a niche beat, which is great. Yeah. So she came up with Noether's theorem, which links symmetries, so things that are invariant or constant in time, to a conservation law, so energy conservation, for example. And this is really important in theoretical physics. It's actually probably quite important for kind of Einstein kind of physics, you know, gravitational waves. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't that like the, how is it called in Einstein's physics, like the mm -mm principle? 
I don't remember. Yeah. Conservation principle, something like that. Conservation principles, yeah, exactly. That's linked to that? I think so. So I would pick her, not just because she's done some amazing maths and physics, but just because she seems... I remember learning about her in my physics degree and thought, oh, she's a very cool person. She was back in the early 20th century. Women weren't really allowed to be lecturers. And she was one of those people. So she had to, I believe she wasn't allowed to advertise lectures as being by her. They had to be under like her male colleague's name. And she was just the assistant, although she was actually the one teaching the lectures. So I think it would be nice to meet someone like that. She's quite inspiring. And she's also very modest. So she said something like, uh, my master's degree, my PhD, it was all crap. And she just seems like a nice person to meet. Yeah, oh, for sure. Okay, perfect. Well, I set that dinner up. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> that way I can listen to the conversation. Well, okay. Thanks a lot, Laura. That really was a huge pleasure to have you on the show. And we covered topics that are completely new to podcast listeners. And I'm pretty sure they will have... Love them. If they didn't, it's okay because I did love them and it's my podcast. So that's all cool. Uh, no, I had a blast. So that was really, really awesome. Thanks a lot. And as usual, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Laura, for taking the time and being on this show. Thank you so much for having me. It has been really fun chatting to you and I hope everyone enjoyed everything I had to say. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. And uh, well, let's see each other for the dinner with uh, Amy. Yeah, that would be lovely. <laughs> Thanks again. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser. And visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good baby. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation. Yeah.